You may have been wondering, who is Mary Murphy? Well, today is the first glimpse into my own story of growing up in a cult, how I know the Duggars, who my dad is, and more. Because growing up in a cult complicates everything. The truth matters. The truth sets us free. You're listening to Out of the Shadows with Mary Murphy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode eight. Today is December 2nd, 2022. Thank you so much for joining to listen. Thank you to all the new listeners. I have been really humbled and excited to see all of the different cities and countries from which you're listening. So thanks so much for being here. It really means a lot to me and is also surprising. I'm really glad you're here. Many people have been had a lot of questions about me and express surprise about different things that have been shared in the podcast so far, and I realized that I never really introduced myself. So today, I'm going to start sharing my own story. Some of the topics I will share today are very sensitive, and I encourage you to please exercise caution when listening to this episode, as it may be very triggering and is not appropriate for young children. I was born and raised in an authoritarian religious cult. Yes, I grew up in a cult. I am the youngest of six children. My biological parents are Dr. Dodie Murphy and Phyllis Murphy. My parents were involved in the Institute in Basic Life Principles basic seminar with Bill Gothard before I was born. They adhered to those beliefs and those teachings before I was born. So I was born and raised under these teachings of the Institute of Basic Life Principles, or IBLP, which was founded by Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard's basic seminar and advanced seminar reached, they claim, IBLP claims 2.5 million people. And it really came to prominence in the 60s and 70s following the sexual revolution in the United States. The Institute of Basic Life Principles later began a homeschool education umbrella program called the Advanced Training Institute, or ATI for short. My family applied to be part of ATI in its first year. However, we were turned down because my biological dad, Dodie Murphy, had been arrested while protesting at an abortion clinic in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And... Gothard and IBLP and ATI just did not want, I guess, that notoriety as part of the first group of families to join ATI. So they said, well, come back in a few years and you can apply again. So we did. However, I was home educated from the very beginning through high school and never, never set foot in a public school to attend it or a Christian school. I was always home educated. My older siblings, some of them did graduate from a Christian school. Before I go further, I want to clarify too that I do refer to Dodie and Phyllis as my biological parents, and that is not in any way meant to be disrespectful or to diss other biological parents who have sacrificed a lot to put their children up for adoption. Calling them my biological parents is a large part of my healing, and I chose to refer to Dodie and Phyllis as my biological parents beginning when I became a parent. Doing so helped me to separate in my mind how I was raised versus how I want to raise my own child. And the connection, the natural connection I feel with my child and the attachment. So I do still acknowledge that they are my my biological parents, and now you know. So moving on, my biological dad was very high up in IBOP. Phil Gothard invited him to, to go to Moscow to start a medical school in conjunction with the Russian government. That never came to pass. The Russians were not really interested in a partnership. However, that's how my family ended up in Russia with 
the cult. As they were still sorting out about the medical school, Bill Gothard and the current director of the, the Russia program it asked my dad to step in as the director of the, of the Russia program on the ground. So my dad did serve as the director of the Moscow Training Center, or the cult compound, in, in Russia for two years. My biological parents and one sibling and I lived there in Moscow with the cult for two years. The Russia program within the cult was always deemed to be the golden child of Bill Gothard. It was his favorite program, his favorite example of what his ministry could do. You had to be invited to be part of, to serve at the, in Moscow, you had to receive that invitation. It was not something you could volunteer for. So to be invited was a really big thing. And then of course, to be the director, as my biological dad was, was an even bigger thing. As far as cult status goes, those who served in Russia were very high up and looked at in awe by other people serving in other places or who were in the home education program. For me, I hold a lot of fond memories of Russia. I was 13 when we moved there. I was 11 the first time we went and um, 13 when we moved there. For me though, it was a first taste of freedom. My biological parents were very busy with overseeing all the Americans and Canadians and new people from New Zealand and Australia and other countries that came through to serve at the cult compound and they were very busy managing all of them and keeping them in line according to the cult rules and it gave me some breathing room because all of a sudden I wasn't at home 24-7 under their thumb. I had some space. I worked in the sewing room as a 13 year old. <laughs> hmm. Child labor? There was a lot of child labor. I worked in the kitchen that summer and the relationships with older girls who were between, I would say age 16 to early 20s, I still carry with me the impact of those relationships. I think it's the first time that I tangibly felt unconditional love and that I was I was really wanted and that I belonged and that's a pretty powerful feeling and especially at that age of 13 to 15 when life is just extra complicated anyway and added in that you're growing up in a cult my life was super complicated and as the director's kid of the premier cult training center that compounds everything as well. Although Russia, I lived in a fishbowl and had a lot of extra pressures because of it, I also experienced freedom and a taste that maybe life could be different. And boy, that first year, I, I loved it and it was amazing. And then I started spreading my wings a little bit, um, challenged my biological dad and that did not go well. And I was basically relegated to the family apartment after that, in a large part. There were a few, few things I was able to do, allowed to do, um, under very close supervision of people who were very, very faithful to the cult. But they, my parents framed it as they wanted me to serve the family and take care of the apartment and do the laundry and the ironing and all of those things as a way to help the family be successful, help my dad be successful. Because as a female, that is, that is the whole goal. That is the whole purpose that as a female uh, daughter to, it is the purpose to make the father successful and of course to prepare to be making the husband successful. 
as well later. That second year was very difficult, very difficult. So fast forward to coming back to the States, back to my little town in Northwest Arkansas where I grew up. It was a really hard transition for me. Moving back to America challenged me even more as the adjustment was really hard. My family walked through a really dark time as well. Then my my last sibling was kicked out of the house and which left me as the only the only child at home. Moving back to America was very difficult for me and I the isolation had elevated exponentially while in Moscow that second year and that continued once we returned to America. Following the move back to America and shortly thereafter I became the last child at home which began the, the next decade of being the only child at home even as I became an adult. I still was considered a daughter and a stay-at-home daughter. But when that last sibling was kicked out, the pressure and expectation on me exponentially elevated. The stakes were very high for, for my biological dad and my biological mom to ensure that I did not rebel, which is what all of my siblings were accused of, of rebelling for, for doing basic things, basic growing up things like going to college or moving out or getting a boyfriend, all the things. <laughs> and those, those are their stories. The stakes were very high for my biological dad to ensure that I did not rebel because my adherence to the cult, my loyalty to him, proved to other people, and I know this because I heard the conversations, that he was valid and he was to be held in high esteem in his ministries were reputable. My biological dad was a medical doctor, Dr. Dodi Murphy, and he used narcotics to drug me for nine years amid a lot of other types of abuse from sexual to mental to psychological. The coercive control permeated every single part of my life from the types of feminine hygiene products that I used to how I chopped tomatoes. The tomato story occurred in the last few months before my biological dad kicked me out in 2008. I was in the kitchen chopping tomatoes, making, making food, and he walked through to um, probably go to his computer in the little office nook and he saw the way I was chopping tomatoes and he stopped and said that's not the way you chop tomatoes and you, you need to do it this way so he instructed me on how to do it given I'm 25 almost 26 and I was engaged to be married in the arranged marriage so I took his instruction because he really didn't have a choice about that and but I also thought I'm going to chop the tomatoes the way I'm chopping them. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not sinning by chopping the tomatoes this way. So I continued to chop the tomatoes. He walked back through out of his little office nook and was most displeased that I was not following his instructions. So he proceeded to take the knife and show me the proper way to cut the tomatoes. Then he left. It's a little glimpse of the coercive control that every single thing Every single choice has to be in submission to the Father and 
there is no free thinking. And I think that I continued chopping the tomatoes. At that point, I had, was seeing through a lot of the hypocrisy and, and I was about to be out of there in this arranged marriage. And of course that didn't go very well for me because he came back in and saw that I was still chopping the tomatoes in the way, in the manner that he did not want me to chop tomatoes. So that was seen as rebellious and sinful that I did not obey or honor his request and instruction to chop tomatoes a certain way. So in such a small, seemingly small thing, I hope that provides a glimpse that coercive control permeates the cult, the practices, the control of every single part of your life, of my life, of other survivors that we've experienced. And it takes a lot to sort through and to um, even begin to make decisions for oneself. At the hands of my biological dad, I survived over two decades of sexual abuse, as well as the nine years of being drugged with narcotics. And I have witnesses to being drugged with narcotics. It's taken a lot of time to put pieces together. However, it's been quite a journey and I'm grateful to be on the side of it. Grateful to have survived. And for those of you who have asked and have questioned if I went to the police, yes, I did go to the police in 2018 and I reported a few of the instances of sexual abuse perpetrated by my biological father on me. And at that time, Arkansas had flip-flopped back to reinstating a statute of limitations on child sexual abuse. My biological dad was not prosecuted, however, going through the experience of reporting to the police and through the interviews, the video recorded taped interviews was very difficult. It was one of the hardest things I had done. I hadn't verbalized any of that, although I had mentioned that I to, to a few people that I had been abused, I had not given any details. So doing that to the police, giving that providing that information, that testimony to the police provided me with some healing and it was a very hard process and I would definitely do it again and after it was hours long, the interview was hours long with the, with the detective however at the end he said do you, is there more? and I said yes but I, I don't, I can't physically give you more today um so it was very, receiving the paperwork from the police and seeing the three felony counts, it helped me it, to, to show that they believed me that so many times victims are told, oh, and, we are, and we're afraid that no one will believe us and that we don't have enough to prove anything. And my testimony was enough. The details were enough, and while he wasn't tried in a court of law, um, I'm confident that had it gone to trial, he would have been imprisoned, and he would have died in prison. And I want to say that really, for those who push and question survivors of abuse, that it's really not up to you whether a victim chooses to report to the police or not, and the timing in which they choose to report or not is not your business. And it's most important to believe survivors and to support them and to offer them the support that they need. I lived under the beliefs and teachings of IVLP and ATI and the culture, the cult culture, for 35 years of my life before I escaped with my young child. And I'm really grateful for escaping 
and for now having five years to heal and to process and to to live free to start to learn how to make those decisions on my own the daily decisions so moving on my first memory of the Duggars is over 30 years ago now Jana and John were nine months to a year at the time uh, Jim Bob and Michelle went to the same church as my family I really enjoyed caring for the little people helping Michelle my mom and I would help them some we'd go over to their house and then I remember when Joe was born and from there I spent as I was the youngest child in my family by four and a half years I I spent a lot of time with Michelle as like a mother's helper when her little her older kids were very little my mom would drop me off and I would spend hours there helping Michelle feeding the kids playing with them doing whatever she wanted me to do I believe my family has actually known Jim Bob and Michelle though much farther back my older siblings went to the same Christian school with Jim Bob back in high school so they've they've known them for much longer than I even remember and I was very close with the older five daughters the older five Duggar girls who are now amazing women and I really considered them to be my sisters they considered me to be their sister and they were going to be in my wedding back in 2008 as light bearers let's see my biological dad also was the medical doctor present at Ginger's birth and Joseph's birth and also served as Jim Bob's campaign manager for his US Senate race in 2002 so moving on I want the truth to be told I have a lot of friends who have escaped the cult I have some friends who are still in the cult I have other friends whose younger siblings are still in the cult the healing process the deconstruction the detangling whatever you want to call it when the foundation of your life as a second generation survivor and I wanted to clarify to a second generation survivor means that you were you were born or you were a child a minor when you were brought into the cult so we did not second generation survivors did not have any choice in the matter at all and I think that's really important to note because our experiences as we're growing and developing as children and teens and the brainwashing and input of the cult police and culture impact us exponentially more and in varied ways than that of our parents who chose to enter the cult of their own volition and that's very very important to remember and also as you interact with survivors or hear the survivor stories I hope that you will keep that in mind because we did not have a choice the second generation survivors did not have a choice about joining the cult being in the cult we had no choice and the cult does not believe in human rights for children and the basic those are basic necessities of shelter and food and medical care the medical neglect is the, the medical neglect that I personally experienced is astonishing and that I have witnessed is astounding there's a lot to talk about and today this episode is just the beginning glimpse of my story of why I do this podcast I really want to provide a platform for survivors to tell their stories speaking the truth sets us free thank you for listening there's so much more to say <laughs> but we have many more episodes to come I'm working on the schedule for the new year for 2023 
The next episode will drop December 16th. And I look forward to sharing more with you then. The last episode of 2022, on December 30th, I will be offering a special opportunity. So stay tuned to hear more about that so that you can participate too. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for caring about the truth. Thank you for caring about me and my story and about all of the survivors from which you heard in the last episode. I hope that your December is starting out well. Thanks for listening. Ciao.